Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the end times. Finally, for the first time in six days, we have seen the sun in South Austin, Texas on this absolutely gorgeous Wednesday morning, December 2nd, 2015. And before I get out of here to, to go sell Christmas trees to clueless morons for the Optimus Club, I'm going to bring in my weekly <clears throat> climate change meltdown roundup rant <coughs> where I go on the pages of the mainstream media, This, in this case Yahoo News, to look for more evidence that this planet is heading directly into a burning lake of fire. And my God, guys, there is no complaints about not finding any climate change news as of the top 100 stories on the planet, it appears to me about 99 of them are about various aspects of these unadulterated horse shit climate talks going on over there in Paris, collectively known correctly as COP21. COP21, so I guess the big question this week for most people trying to figure out what is going on over there is what is COP 21. What is COP 21? So we're on the pages. I went straight to the United Nations website. From the United Nations verbatim, what is COP 21? <clears throat> COP 21 is the single biggest collection of planet-eating, lying, grandstanding, hypocritical shills for the fossil fuel industry ever gathered together in the history of humankind, posing for photo ops and slapping each other on the back while convincing nobody but their deluded selves and a few other hopelessly clueless morons on the planet that they are doing one goddamn thing to save this planet from climate change while they send their own children into a burning lake of fire in their chaotic, self-serving mission to create their own brand of horse shit, environmental legacy. Okay, so now that we know directly from the United Nations what COP 21 is, let's dive in. Good God, guys, I, I don't know. I picked out just like 12 or 15 of these stories from uh, coming out of there. What is probably the best review of COP 21 is coming from my company Dumpty Tribe hero, Bill McKibben writing in Foreign Policy Magazine. The Paris Climate Talks will be a historic success and a historic disaster. So this is Bill McKibben's uh, summation of COP21. <clears throat> Here's how to think about what happens in Paris over the course of the next two weeks. The conference is not the game, it is the scorecard. Diplomats, heads of states, activists, they will all be descending onto the French capital over the next few days. It will be a three-ring circus overseen by 3,000 reporters. There will be congressional delegations, indigenous delegations, and delegations of peasant farmers. There will be oil lobbyists, coal lobbyists, <coughs> and automobile lobbyists. There will be frantic negotiations that break down and restart and then break down again. And there will be some genuinely important decisions. But for the most part, the decisions have already been made. The action happened not in Paris, but in the streets and in engineering labs over the last half decade and has changed the question markedly since the failed talks at the Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009. Those talks were not just a failure, they were a fiasco. <clears throat> know nothing except some vague pledge to keep the planets warming below 2 degrees Celsius 
It made Munich look like a diplomatic masterstroke. Paris will go better, not en well enough to save the planet, but maybe, maybe just well enough to save our chances of saving the planet. Here's why. And so then <coughs> he digs around for some good news. Uh, he gets out his bloodhounds and electron microscope to dig up a few nuggets of good news. But let's jump ahead uh, later on to the story to the reality. <coughs> That is historic, that is remarkable, and that is also a disaster. A, he's talking about that everything they're doing, and uh, the best case scenario under what they're agreeing on in Copenhagen, what he's talking about, will not, has no chance of limiting this planet to two degrees. The absolute most optimistic scenario is three and a half degrees <clears throat> Celsius. So what does that look like in the, in, according to Bill McKibben, a world that warms three and a half degrees <clears throat> would not be a world with civilizations <coughs> that resemble ours. In fact, even the long time negotiating goal of two degrees is clearly too high. We've heated the planet one degree so far since the Industrial Age began, and the UN said in November that has produced a world where four billion people have already been affected by extreme weather disasters over the last 20 years. So far this fall, we have seen the highest wind speeds and the lowest barometric pressure ever recorded. We've seen two rare cyclones plow into Yemen, and they came a week apart, dropping the normal equivalent of 10 years of rain in a few hours. We've seen, well, I could go on. The point is that one degree has been enough to melt most of the summer sea ice in the Arctic, fundamentally destabilize the Antarctic ice sheets, and make the oceans 30% more acidic. And we're hoping for two degrees and aiming for three and a half? Yep. <clears throat> so, after Copenhagen, the scoreboard read fossil fuel industry 50, planet zero. Call that halftime. After Paris, the score will be more like fossil fuel industry 60 planet 30. Reality is beginning to catch up, but it's not halftime anymore. We hope it's the end of the third quarter, but there's reason to believe it's actually much later in the game. 2015 looks set to be the hottest year ever recorded in October, the hottest month we have ever measured. Indeed, October smashed the old record by such large margins that nervous climatologists called it stunning, shocking, <clears throat> and potentially the start of a new, more dangerous phase for the planet's temperature. So that is Paris. That is COP21, according to Bill McKibben. We will not win the climate fight. We won't even come close, but at least we will know the score and we'll know how much we have to do in the next few crucial years. <clears throat> and so that's really the, the best summation I've found, but I'm just, you know guys, I'm just going to run down uh, a few other headlines. I, just reading the headlines today would take more than 30 minutes. What is the Pope? Uh, saying about uh, COP21, Pope says climate situation is, quote, borderline suicide. Yes, Pope Francis said Monday it was now or never for the world community to, ha to hammer out a deal on climate change, warning the situation was, quote, borderline suicide. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah that's what our planet-eating pope has to say. But, guys, you know, let, let me in interrupt all the doom and gloom. We do have some... Uh, <clears throat> We do have some good news. Uh, if, if you don't think that these uh, government shills are saving the planet, let's hear some of the corporations. These are some of these planet-eating industrial corporations showing up in Paris, uh, bragging about how they are going to save the planet from climate change. Okay, here is Monsanto pledges to be carbon neutral by 2021. Warning, warning. Bullshit, All right, let's see. That was Monsanto. Here are some clothing brands and stores that just pledged to address climate change. Okay, here is Kohl's. Uh, I love the name Kohl's. It's K-O-H-L, but you have to love the name uh, uh, of, of this corporation called Kohl's, saving the planet from climate change. Of course, don't forget Nike, saving the planet. We have Levi Strauss and Company, saving the planet from climate change. And of course, my two favorites, Target and Walmart, saving the planet from climate change. I see a guy, Hambone Littletail, having a comment about this story. Is there one clueless moron alive anywhere on this planet stupid enough to believe one word of this corporate greenwashing BS? It almost doesn't matter what side of the climate debate you are on to recognize this shill game. Stop insulting our intelligence, please. Okay, let's see. Uh, how about this one? I guess this was going on behind the scenes uh, in Paris. I don't guess this was actually at Paris. This is somewhere behind the scenes. Funding from Exxon and the Koch brothers gave climate change deniers a megaphone in climate change debate. This is a Yale researcher set out to discover how much impact mega-wealthy corporations and individuals have had on the American public's confusion about climate change. The answer, just as much as, if not more, than many have claimed. There you go. So this guy, uh, Justin Farrell, crunched all of these different uh, different stu these big data to show that over the past two decades climate contrarians funded by ExxonMobil and the Koch brothers family foundations have been the most successful at spreading talking points on uncertainty about climate change science into the US news media and political discussions. That messaging has helped the American public's disbelief about climate change despite the worldwide scientific consensus that global warming is a pressing and major threat to both humanity and the environment. And in a related study, Farrell found that Exxon and Koch funding of climate change contrarian entities played a major role in polarizing public discussions of climate change over the last 20 years, to put it mildly. Okay. Uh, you know, one 
of the subjects being discussed at at uh, Paris this week, although not nearly enough, is the whole subject of deforestation. So this article <clears throat> looks at uh, looks at that subject, titled "How to Cut Deforestation in Half to Save the Climate." So uh, I anyway, so I read this article this entire article from beginning to end and as I say I agree with this guy uh, calling himself Hambone Littletail and his comment the only minor problem with this article is that nowhere does it mention how to cut deforestation in half. It was never brought up in the article, How to Cut Deforestation in Half to Save the Climate, they left one subject out of the story. I anybody on this planet uh, who, who believes for one second that we are going to cut deforestation in half on this planet uh, this century, got, got one thing to tell you, and they're saying about 2020. Now, there's a whole lot of uh, talk. Let's take on two, uh, two more subjects here, because I'm right, I, I got to go. I, I, I consider for hours doing this. One of the big, uh, probably the biggest evil to pick on, the easiest. Uh, devil in the room, elephant in the living room to pick on is big coal. Big coal. Everyone heaping up on big coal with their scorn and uh, talking about how we're going to save the planet from coal burning. So let's look at two stories about coal burning as the climate changes are going on. We have this report <clears throat> banks, the, the, we're talking about the global banksters behind it all profiting from coal despite climate alarm. All right. <clears throat> the world's biggest banks are plowing hundreds of billions of dollars into coal mining despite claiming to be leaders in the fight against climate change. According to a report issued at COP21, <clears throat> see many of the world's biggest banks have started to cut back on their financing of coal, the burning of which leads to greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming, blah, blah, blah. But they have provided more than $257 billion in coal financing over the past six years compared with $105 billion for all renewable energies combined. And, uh, so, what is the bottom line about coal burning on, on planet Earth? Uh, I do like the, uh, the photo for this story, if you can, if you can see this. I don't know where this coal burning plant is. I'm assuming China. All right. This one... Some, this gets right to the point. New coal plants would tip Earth to dangerous warming. And this is just looking at the, at the coal plants on the drawing board this week. While scientists agree that humanity needs to phase out coal within 35 years, about uh, 35 minutes, 
thousands of new plants are being planned that would doom any hope of keeping global warming to safer levels, analysts said Tuesday. Greenhouse gas emitted by these planned 2,440 potential coal burning plants on top of those already in operation right now, just by themselves, would breach the UN unadulterated horseshit target of restricting the planet's temperature rise, according to the mid-range estimate by Climate Action Tracker, a respected research group. Uh, even if no new plants are built, emissions <clears throat> from existing coal-fired power generation in the year 2030 would be about 150% higher than they should be for staying under the two degree ceiling. Quote, this is Peter Van Brevoort, uh, part of the project, quote, there is one solution to this issue of too many coal plants on the books cancel them. There you go. I anybody who believes that, that, that this group of planet eaters, uh, the, the shills for the fossil fuel industry masquerading as some sort of environmentalists at the UN are, are, are going to cancel these 2,440 new coal plants, got one thing to tell you. Now, of course, one of the other major things, probably the single biggest fight, coal was the big agreement. The biggest, uh, the biggest disagreement uh, is between the poor countries and the rich countries. And that this whole big argument uh, which is the classic example of how overconsumption and overpopulation are the two heads of the snake killing this planet. So the rich countries such as the U.S. pointing to those 1.3 billion people over there in China uh, being, you know, since China is the number one greenhouse gas emitter, even though they have low per capita emissions at this point, that cumulatively their populations in China and India, who are the number one and three biggest uh, emitters, that they're the problem, while China and India, number one and three, pointing their fingers at the number two emitter, saying the U.S. because of our per capita emissions. So what is, if you crunch the numbers, according to this report from the French News Service, world's richest 10% produce half of the CO2 on the planet. The richest 10% of people produce half of Earth's climate-harming fossil fuel emissions, while the poorest 50% contribute 10%. So 10% produce 50%, while 50% produce 10%, and the 40% in the middle make up the other 40%. This is British charity Oxfam said in a study released uh, on Wednesday. Disputes over how to share responsibility for curbing greenhouse gas emissions and aiding climate vulnerable countries are among the thorniest and longest running issues in the 25 year old UN climate process. Uh, quoting the Oxfam study, <clears throat> rich high emitters 
should be held accountable for their emissions no matter where they live, but it's easy to forget that rapidly developing economies are also home to the majority of the world's very poorest people, and while they have to do their fair share, it is rich countries should, uh, that should lead the way. You know, this whole study is bullshit. It's everybody. It's overpopulation and overconsumption. If the rich pigs don't cut back their consumption and goddamn China and India and Sub-Saharan Africa don't cut back their populations, it doesn't matter. This planet is screwed either way, and since neither are going to do that, the, these rich pigs aren't going to cut back their consumption, and, and these breeding-like rabbits countries aren't going to cut back their populations, either way, this planet is doomed. And, of course, many stories, uh, looking at this story, uh, this week out of China and India about the unbelievable record levels of smog in China and India as uh, as the these climate meetings take place. I just chose a couple here is China orders factories shut as smog nightmare continues. China has ordered thousands of factories to shut as it grapples with swaths of choking smog that were nearly 24 times safe levels on Tuesday, casting a shadow over the country's participation in Paris climate talks. Jesus, uh, airlines canceling uh, flights, blah, blah, blah. The environmental woes came <clears throat> after Chinese President Xi Jinping took the stage at crucial international talks aiming to <clears throat> limit dangerous climate change. He vowed action on greenhouse gas emissions while re repeating existing pledges while telling the summit that poor nations should not have to sacrifice economic growth to save the planet from climate change. Uh, <clears throat> Beijing pledged China is estimated to have released between 9 and 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide in 2013 from coal burning and auto exhaust, nearly twice as much as the U.S. and two and a half times the European Union. Beijing pledged last year that carbon dioxide output would peak by around 2030, suggesting at least another decade of growing emissions. Social media users in China were skeptical about the chances of any cleanup, with many circulating a picture of a Beijing newspaper front page from 1999 saying, quote, in this headline from 16 years ago, we absolutely will not let big pollution enter the new century. Oh, come on now. That ain't even bullshit. That's horseshit. Okay, one more story out of, uh, out of China. Beijing smog fails to obscure apocalypse humor. <clears throat> Several days of brown haze in Beijing so thick it has closed highways, 
suspended construction and brought official warnings to stay indoors have also prompted jokes about the end of the world. One joke circulating among Chinese journalists told of a reporter approaching an old woman on the street to ask about the impact of the, of the smog. Quote, the impact is huge, the interviewee replies. First of all, I am your uncle. That's an example of Chinese apocalyptic humor. But as long as we're talking about the, uh, the apocalypse and doomsday, if this next story is true, then, uh, <clears throat> you, you know, just when you thought it was safe to go back outside, we have <clears throat> Doomsday Revisited. Will global warming deprive us of oxygen? Global warming has triggered an array of apocalyptic scenarios for future generations from worsening drought, storms, and floods to melted ice sheets and rising seas. <clears throat> now, a new study published on Tuesday and coinciding with COP21 adds to the grim tableau. The risk that warming at the far end of the scale could rob our planet of oxygen. <clears throat> This is a new study from Britain's University of Leicester. Quote, we have identified another possible <clears throat> consequence of global warming that can potentially be more dangerous than all of the others. <clears throat> this is if average global warming hits six degrees uh, Celsius. <clears throat> Quote, that would mean oxygen depletion not only in the water, but also in the air. Should that happen, it would obviously kill most of life on Earth. Yep. And, quote, there may be there may be very, no, I'm sorry, the message from this study is that there may be another disaster approaching us as a consequence of global warming, and it may be much worse than all the other consequences identified so far. There may be very little warning signs before the disaster actually happens. But once the critical threshold is passed, then the catastrophe will develop fast. The danger is probably more real than to be drowned, I guess, by rising sea level. So there you go, guys. <clears throat> Smoke them if you got them while you still have the oxygen to smoke a bowl. But uh, I've got to wrap up this week's uh, climate change roundup about COP21 and get back to the Optimist Club to continue selling Christmas trees arriving here by the 18-wheeler truckload to clueless morons. So for the December 2nd, 2015 edition of my climate change meltdown roundup round roundup rant. Bye guys.